Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Lee Harris, Mayor of Shelby County. I'm uh, pleased to be here on behalf of the Joint COVID Task Force. Uh, right now, we are in a very challenging period. We know we are in the fall surge. Uh, there is some good news on the horizon. Uh, vaccines have been identified and the results so far look promising. But we are still several weeks away from even a limited distribution of any kind of vaccine in Shelby County and probably months away from a vaccine that's available to all. And so until then, we have to all work to continue the course. Uh, that's why uh, this week we will be working with the leaders across West Tennessee and throughout our region to encourage masking. Uh, that includes to encourage those other communities to adopt mandatory masking requirements. And so the health department and other stakeholders and yours truly will be meeting with those leaders uh, this week. There are some 21 counties uh, across West Tennessee and there are 70 cities across West Tennessee. And so we will try as best we can uh, to encourage all who can to adopt a mandatory masking approach because that will help everyone in our region. We know that what takes place in Shelby County affects the uh, outlying communities around Shelby County and what happens in those communities affects Shelby County. The virus has no boundaries and so we have to continue uh, to work together from a regional perspective in order to slow the spread. Also, we're going to continue to encourage all organizations in Shelby County to adopt screening techniques, which by the way are required under the Shelby County Health Directive. Uh, one of the things that we've learned so far is that even a small number of cases can lead to spread uh, and an outsized number of confirmed cases. Uh, in Shelby County, we've adopted digital screening as our approach after a few um, 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 trials and error. Uh, this process is incorporated right now in at least six of our buildings, and we are constantly expanding and reviewing our digital screening approach. For the month of October, we screened more than 14,000 people that entered into Shelby County government buildings. And since our digital screening process began in August, we have screened over 31,000 individuals. About 80% of the folks that uh, experience our digital screening process are able to give us um, um, their background as to signs and symptoms using their iPhone. Uh, and then the rest are able to use an iPad that is set up, an iPad kiosk is set up outside many of our um, um, interest locations. The technology used for our screening process is technology that we have, for the most part, developed internally, including the web forms and the QR codes and so forth. And so just kudos to the Shelby County Information Technology Services and our Office of uh, Performance and Innovation. Um, one of the benefits uh, of the digital screening is that we have been able to redirect people that do present signs and symptoms. Uh, through the screening process, we've redirected about 106 individuals so far. Uh, in addition to that, the digital technology allows us to have more uh, social distance between screeners and identifying uh, the information that's needed. Contact tracing is also a lot easier with the digital screening because it uh, makes it easier to uh, have in one place the uh, identity and the contact information for everyone who visits uh, our, our buildings. So we continue to work on this process and we continue to encourage all organizations to adopt some kind of screening protocol per what you'll find in the health directive. We know that none of these tools are foolproof and the virus is highly transmissible, but this is one of the tools in the toolkit that'll help us uh, to uh, identify those folks that could lead to, as I said, outside spread. If you want technical assistance on setting up your screening at your organization, we'd be happy to assist and we'll put up a slide with a contact phone number. Please reach out uh, to us uh, if you would like technical guidance on setting up a screening pro protocol at your organization. At this time, I'd like to welcome to the podium uh, David Sweat, who leads the COVID response. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, good afternoon. I um, wanted to give you an update on the, where we are with the number of cases in Shelby County. 
Today is a important day. We've diagnosed now 43,641 individuals with COVID-19 disease so far since March the 7th, and we had 835 new cases reported today. Um, that is the largest single day number of cases reported to us in the pandemic, and it does represent individuals, all of whom were diagnosed since the 11th of November. So these are all recently diagnosed cases, but uh, have been transmitted to us through by the Tennessee Department of Health surveillance program, catching us up with, um, with their data transmission feeds. So bringing us current to date and giving us 835 new case reports yesterday. We've had 613 people die in Shelby County from COVID-19 disease. And we've recently done some analysis of those deaths um, not only in terms of their comorbidities and risk factors, which we have commented on many times, but also just looking at the distribution of deaths over time. What we know now, because there is a delay between when somebody dies and the uh, death certificates are certified and, and reported to us through vital record system, is that August was a pretty brutal month for us in terms of deaths by number. We had some weeks when as many as 30 one or 32 people died during the month of August. But on a percentage basis, our healthcare system has improved in the treatment of individuals with COVID-19 disease. Back in April and May, we were seeing that up to 4% or more of the cases diagnosed in a certain week may experience fatality. But now, with improvements in understanding of treatment, the healthcare system is, is producing uh, better results and our fatality rates as a percentage basis have gone down throughout the epidemic. So thank you to our healthcare systems and medical providers for all the work that they're doing in the hospitals. When it comes to hospitals, we have 389 individuals hospitalized as of 5 p.m. last night. We are back to where we were in the middle of July in terms of the numbers of hospitalizations. This is a very critical time. We've had 619,666 people uh, or tests performed in Shelby County, and we have widespread availability of testing. So anyone who needs to be tested to find out if they have COVID-19 disease, there are appointments still available. In fact, more appointments now than ever before, almost 14,000 appointment slots available throughout the county. In Tipton County and in surrounding areas, I'll give you a report that um, overall, Tennessee, 318,888 cases have been reported. In Tipton County, 3,144. And in DeSoto County, Mississippi, 8,912 cases have been reported. That is right now one of the most active areas in our, in our uh, metropolitan area is DeSoto County along with Shelby County. Crittenden County, Arkansas, 2,777 cases have been reported there. So as Mayor said, this is a time for all of us to work together and to wear our masks, to practice social distancing, to wash our hands, and to stay home. If we are sick, please do not go out and about in the community. Please do not go to work with signs and symptoms of COVID-19 disease. This is a vitally dangerous time for us to try to slow the spread because the numbers are exponentially growing. With that, I'll turn it over to Director Lisa Householder. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanna make a few additional comments. Uh, approximately two weeks ago, I shared that the data was foreshadowing a very challenging fall and winter. And as Mayor Harris noted, we really are at the beginning of that. So I wanna reinforce what you've heard from both David and Mayor Harris is that this is a very challenging time and it's critical that we continue the course and focus really on individual decision-making, decisions for our families and decisions for our communities. We are impacted heavily now, much different than in March and even June and July from what's happening in surrounding counties. So I wanna reinforce the one item that David had in the list about um, limiting travel, really making decisions about travel, particularly as we move into the holiday season. 
But the main thing that I wanted to emphasize um, is I think the public would be looking at the tripwires and asking what are we going to do next and what are our next actions. So we do know that we're continuing to trend upward. We've had the largest number of reported cases in a 24-hour period today. That's making it difficult not only for the hospital systems, but also for the public health system to do contact tracing. We also know that our reproductive rate is above 1.2 and our duplication rate is shortening, which means uh, that the t uh, time it takes to double the cases is now at about 42 days. So that's uh, significant because that brings us right into the holiday season when we could have double the cases that we have currently. So we are looking at the data daily and throughout the day. Uh, we have some recommendations that we'll um, share with Mayor Harris and have conversation. But ultimately, if you look at the Tripwires document, if we continue in the same direction, we will have to make some decisions that are, again, countywide decisions. So I am imploring each and every one of you to do what you can as individuals so that we can all, as a larger community, move forward. We know the majority of our cases are in individuals younger than age 45. So for those of you who are young adults, I really encourage you to think about the activities that you engage in and wearing masks when you're around others, limiting your um, visits to other people, particularly spending time with those who are in your household and avoiding activities or events where you're going to connect with people outside your household. We can get through this, but it's going to take each of us to continue the course. And then I also want to encourage you to think about testing. Um, we want everyone to get tested if you want to be tested, but we also are encouraging people as you go into the holiday season to get tested before you travel, if you choose to travel, or if you're having individuals come into your home. That way you have an idea of what your status is. I know on Thursday there will be more information on additional opportunities for testing. So I'll pause there and open it up for questions. Chris Luther, WMC. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, so the uh, presidents and CEOs of the four major ho major hospital systems in uh, the Mid-South have all released a, are all signed on to an op-ed, uh, basically reiterating so many of the things you've already said, um, asking people to continue being vigilant. Um, they've also said, you know, we know you're tired, but we cannot give up. How concerned are you about fatigue in the community in terms of people um, getting tired of socially distancing, of washing hands, of wearing masks and, and, and whatnot? And then my second question is, um, it looks like the hospital numbers aren't looking too bad. Um, I believe Mr. Sweat earlier said that um, they were looking at the same rates for about July as they are now. Um, how closely are you watching the hospital rates and hospitalizations and how important is hospitalization rates in the coming weeks and months, especially after the record setting number of cases today? Okay, so that was several questions and hopefully I won't miss them, but if I do, I may ask you to clarify, um, particularly the first question. So every day we look at four sets of data. We look at the pandemic itself. That's things like the trend line, as well as number of new cases, reproductive rate, the things that you're accustomed to us reporting on. We also look at hospital capacity. So we look at that every day. We look at how it's changing. One of the things that we're focused on currently is staffing. What we know nationwide is there is a nursing shortage, but as the pandemic has spread and so many communities are affected, we really have lost our ability as a country to move nurses from one area to another to fill in when there are shortages. An example is many nurses went to New York during their surge. Um, it's very difficult now to recruit if we needed nurses here. So staffing is going to be part of that as well. We look at testing capacity and we look at public health capacity. All of those are critical as we move forward, but we're particularly concerned about hospital capacity as we get into the holiday season. Clearly, we want anyone who has COVID to be able to be treated, but we also want people who suffer injuries from a motor vehicle crash or someone who suffers a heart attack or suffers a stroke to be able to access care and have a bed in the hospital. So we really want to um, do everything that we can to reduce those numbers. 
but also keep in mind that all the surrounding counties come to Memphis Shelby County for care when they need particularly intensive care or specialty care. So we have to look at what's happening in those surrounding counties and how that might impact us as well. So I think I answered all of your hospital questions, but your very initial question, if you could repeat that. Sure, no problem. Uh, these ho in their op-ed, these hospital leaders uh, were basically concerned about fatigue in okay. terms of being strict. Um, what, uh, well, yeah, what's your concern level with you know just fatigue in terms of battling the spread? You know, I, I think everyone is is fatigued. Um, again, some months ago, we really began to say this is a marathon, not a sprint. So for anybody who's played sports, anybody who's been in the military, uh, anybody who has done a marathon, you do have periods of fatigue, but you have to kind of prepare for the rest of the battle. And I would say this is the time that we need to um, step back and really focus so that we can put our energy in moving forward. Uh, I know fatigue is real, but we need to move beyond that and use um, really the data to help drive us to be a healthier community. This is a difficult time, and if we become too fatigued and complacent, um, we actually will have much more difficulty, particularly as we get into the end of December. Brad Broders, Local 24. Thanks. Good afternoon, Dr. Househalter. Uh, speak, I know you talked about talking with Mayor Harris about, uh, you know, tough discussions potentially of what are some of the things you all are discussing of potentially returning in terms in terms of restrictions good afternoon so you know i'm not going to give too much detail um, what i would say is you can look at the tripwires document and we have some key things listed there you can also look at what's happening nationally and look at what the data is telling us nationally and locally we know that any place that people gather and don't wear a mask is a place for transmission so those are things like gyms, limited service restaurants, and so on. We also are preempted from uh, really making decisions about certain places. So an example, we know churches and other places of worship are areas where transmission occurs, but we're not able to give direction there. So we'll likely give some recommendations for areas such as uh, places of worship. Yeah, we'll Thanks. I, I, I know the... I know the public out there is just wondering what could potentially be out there. Um, and as a follow up, um, e either you or David could help with this. Just what are what are some ongoing just challenges right now that's causing this uh, this spread, and and how is this impacting um, uh, laser focused contact tracing investigations with all these new cases? So I'll start first, and I'll turn it over to David because he may want to add some additional insights. Um, as we've noted before, we added a different interview tool so that we could get more laser focused on not only contact tracing, but if we had to implement more countywide measures, we had data to drive that. The key things that we know are individuals continue to minimize their symptoms. So um, four out of five people actually have symptoms. I think there's a lot of fear of the asymptomatic spreaders, but that's one out of five. Four out of five people have symptoms and continue to go about their daily activities while they are symptomatic anywhere from one to three days. I will use a workplace example where an employee we know was probably um, symptomatic about three days, went into various buildings around a variety of people, and ultimately for that one an in individual, approximately 40 to 45 people were quarantined. Of those 45 people, some of them may end up with COVID. So that's a critical piece we keep messaging. If you're sick at all, even very minor symptoms, please go get tested and stay home. And then within those activities that people engage in is they continue to go to work and they continue to go engage in social activities like visit with friends, go out to restaurants and so on and so forth. So those things are contributing. We have fairly good mask usage in Shelby County. Where people are probably not quite there yet is wearing a mask around someone like a family member who doesn't live in their household. And we, in the beginning, talked about wearing a mask in public, but now we're really saying wear a mask when you're around anyone who's not in your household. That's to protect yourself as well as to protect them. So increasing our masking in those other settings is gonna be critical as well. So I'm gonna ask David if he wants to add some things. Uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Alsalter, and thank you, Brad. Um, yes, in terms of the, the laser focus, I mean, what we are trying to do is learn from the interview tools, and we have learned a lot, right? There are certain things that, based on the interviews and data, we are not as concerned about as, as we might, could have been, but we have data to back us up. For instance, uh, people are wearing a mask to a large degree whenever they're out shopping at the grocery store. So we see high mask utilization, high mask wearing in retail environments like, you know, grocery stores and pharmacies and places like that. So we're not as concerned about transmission occurring in those settings, but what we do see overrepresented in the data, activities that people say they were doing either before they got uh, infected, so places where they could have been exposed, or activities that they participated in while they were themselves infectious. And those really fall into three main categories right now based on the data. So socializing, just hanging out with other people, either in their own home or in somebody else's home or in some setting, some social setting. So socializing as a group of activities. And then going out to eat in restaurants and then working out in gyms. These are all activities that when we interview the recent cases, based on 450 interviews just last, uh, you know, analyzed last week, we see those activities are over overrepresented among people with COVID-19 disease. And so that gives us clues that those environments, as Dr. Househalter mentioned earlier, the kinds of places you take your mask off. So when you're working out, taking the mask off, you're breathing, you're breathing hard, you're in a social environment eating, you take your mask off so you can eat and drink, but you're sitting at a table and talking with someone. Or you're just hanging out with friends or family members. Those are the kinds of settings right now that the information we're gathering suggests is where the virus is being transmitted the most. Jane Roberts, Daily Memphian. Jane, are you there? Jacob Steimer, Memphis Business Journal. Yeah, thank you uh, for taking the time. Um, Dr. Haushalter, I was wondering um, if you could, um, you know, kind of reconcile for me what you've just been talking about with restaurants um, and, what, and what we're seeing in the data with them, with um, what we were seeing a, a few weeks ago with talking about how there were, you know, no active restaurant clusters. Um, and um, I, I think I saw Dr. McCullers talk about, you know, a, a lack of relative concern with um, restaurants. So it's really looking at the data two different ways. One would be you have a specific restaurant where more than two cases reported being at at the same time and therefore their infection is linked to that specific restaurant that would allow us to target that restaurant only and not target the rest of the restaurants another example there um, is nursing homes or schools with nursing homes we've been reporting the clusters associated with those because we know that the cases whether they're employees or patients or residents were associated with that specific facility at a specific period of time. The other is looking at all of the data at one time. So in the interview tool, when we're doing the case investigation, what we do is we have categories of places that people have been while they were infectious and or when they were likely to have contracted the infection. And within that, we have a large proportion of people who have continued to engage in what we know are regular activities, going to work, socializing with friends um, or family, going to restaurants, and those types of things. So you have those, those are two separate sets of data and they both inform different actions. But we also know just in general that any location, so that could be anything from a restaurant to a movie theater, to a bowling alley where you might eat um, in between bowling, 
is that any place that you take your mask off and you're indoors and you're close to others and engaging in socializing, talking, maybe even talking loud because the sound is louder, those are high risk for transmission. So we actually look at all of those as we begin to look at what population level or countywide interventions will help reduce the spread. You have a follow up? Yeah, I wanted to follow up on uh, something Dr. Randolph said during a press conference last week about how any return to restrictions would, uh, the decision would primarily be made by public officials, not the health department. Um, I know that, well, I'm just kind of curious if you could expand on, on how that decision making dynamic looks currently and how it may have evolved over the last uh, six months. So that's a great question, um, and I'm gonna make a comment before I um, answer it fully. I know there's a lot of controversy currently about the role of local health departments in the six metros and our ability to make independent decisions. But regardless of the authority that the health departments have, particularly in Shelby County, we have always had what I've said is a very robust decision-making process. And I don't think that that has changed over the course of the pandemic. From the very beginning, because of the Joint Task Force, Mayor Harris's leadership and his convening of other mayors, we have had what we, I would say are internal health department discussions because we have the data. Um, you know, I see David every day, I see Dr. Randolph every day, multiple times a day, so we can talk about the data and have t huddles every day. We then also invite colleagues and have meetings with colleagues. Dr. Jane, Dr. McCullers, and others to say, what are you thinking about the data? What are you um, learning from your research? What are you learning from colleagues in other areas? And then we also then share that with the elected officials and have very robust dialogue and when necessary, heated debate. But what we do is try to balance, one, what does the science tell us? What does the data tell us? I also say, what does the math tell us? Because we do have to look at our population and what will impact the full population. But balance that with other things that are needed in our community. What's the economic impact? What's the impact on violence? What's the impact on mental health? Do we have enough resources to make sure that if people are isolated in quarantine that they don't, you know, that they have the ability to pay their rent, that they don't go hungry, that they don't go without medications? And then based on all of that, a decision is made. Then ultimately, we also have legal way in. The health directive is then written, and that's written really in partnership with myself, Dr. Randolph, and Mayor Harris, again with a legal review. And then we issue the directive from there. So at the current time, the health department still has the authority to enact um, those interventions necessary to protect or promote the public's health. But we have always done that as a team and not as, as I've said before, we don't arbitrarily make up decisions in, in my office or someone else's office. It, it has been a very collegial process from the beginning. And I don't, do you want to comment on that all, Mayor? Um, I, 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 sure. Okay. <laughs> I think I think um, we're in a very challenging time, and I think when you're in a challenging time, the only way you're going to make progress is through a collaborative effort. And so everybody has been working very hard uh, together, uh, and at the same time, we've been working very hard at consensus. And throughout the last seven or eight months, I think that we have achieved consensus on 95 percent. Uh, of items. Uh, the other 5%, obviously, like Director Householder says, sometimes there's, there's debate, but we let the data drive action. But I think we all acknowledge that the only way we're going to get something big done is a collaborative approach. And so I think that's just really at the heart of the process the, the whole time. We are out of time today. Are there any closing messages from any panelists? I'll just say, since I was here, thank you all uh, for uh, staying 
uh, tuned in because uh, we are, again, at a very critical juncture in the course of this pandemic. Uh, and this is the time to really, um, you know, redouble our efforts. We're going to redouble our efforts here to, to message around the importance of washing hands and wearing masks and social distance. And we would encourage all of you uh, to please use your platforms uh, to communicate those same kinds of messages. And every, if everybody does that uh, little bit, then that will add up to a whole lot, and I think we will be able to get past this moment and on to the next milestone and the one after that. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you back here on Thursday.